advanced semiotics, and every year to have a feature and theme. This uh, year is this year is devoted to the theme of uh, anonymous signification, anonymous communication. Uh, you have already uh, listened to many lecturers uh, uh, speaking about this topic, but today I have the immense pleasure to introduce to you uh, not only a guest speaker, but also a visiting professor, uh, Professor Everardo Garcia Reyes, uh, who will deliver this lecture to you today. And you see the title, <coughs> Hiding and Uncovering Strategies in Digital Media. But from today, uh, he will also be visiting professor at the University of Turin. The University of Turin, in particular our department, has this policy of inviting foreign professors uh, from abroad to increase the uh, quality and quantity of teachings that are uh, offered to University uh, uh, students. And uh, Professor Eberardo Garcia Reyes will uh, teach a course in visual semiotics. And in particular, he will devote uh, this course on visual semiotics, uh, which is uh, primarily uh, addressed to master students, so to students of part of level to uh, a visualization of data and digital semiotics, which is uh, uh, the specific field of Eberardo, Professor Eberardo Garcia-Reyes' uh, research, a publications and teaching. He's professor at the University of Paris uh, 8, uh, which is a university in Paris that is uh, always characterized by, by yeah, the humanities, but also uh, by being extremely trendy, so by interpreting humanities not in a traditional way, but always exploring cross fertilizations between traditional status in humanities and uh, new developments in technology, new developments in sciences, new trends in philosophy, and also a new trends in, uh, let's say, the social discourse. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a little bit the profile also of Professor Eduardo Garcia Reyes, so we're very pleased to have him here. Because you see, uh, in uh, the academic world, you have people who cultivate traditional knowledge, and uh, of course, we need that kind of uh, activity. But we also have people like Everardo, uh, whom I uh, characterized at his best, if I may, as smart professor. He's very smart. So he's constantly uh, doing new things. <coughs> Uh, is constantly interacting with the best minds in the world, including Len Mandich, who is a key figure in uh, um, communication studies nowadays, one of the most important in the world. Um, and uh, he's a smart guy, you know, he's, he's, he's a skater, he has, a, you know, he has many, many qualities. So, um, he's originally from Mexico, but uh, he has, uh, after a career in Mexico, he's moved to France, and this is also a, a evidence of his uh, smartness different continents, different languages, different countries. Now we're very pleased to have him uh, here in, uh, in Italy. So uh, without further ado, I'll give him now the floor and he's going to um, address to you this lecture on uh, the title Hiding and Uncovering Strategies in Digital Media. Uh, we're going to um, record a video of uh, the lecture, so uh, please uh, uh, don't make too much noise because otherwise we're going to listen to it all while we to be able to go to examinations. And as always, I propose you to uh, welcome Professor Radio Serrius with uh, a little bit of applause. Well, uh, thank you very much, Massimo. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the opposite. I, it's me who is very thankful and grateful of being here with you. and. Uh, <coughs> You know, in Paris, it would be like very difficult to have that many students interested in semiotics, visual semiotics, at nine in the morning. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm, I'm gonna be here for one month. So I'm gonna mainly teach this course on visual semiotics on Thursday and Friday. But uh, if you mm, like uh, uh, get interested in what in, in what I will show you, if you want to dig deeper into that, you want to discuss a little bit on that, if you want to do something else, just uh, count on me. I'm going to be here the whole month, so we can, we can discuss furthermore. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, 
answering to the, to the invitation by uh, Massimo, I, 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 I assembled these this, uh, slides to share some things that I, that I, that I do, some things that uh, will deal with hiring and covering strategies in digital media. So uh, perhaps, well, as Massimo said, my uh, a real small personal introduction. So I am mainly like you. I come from information and communication sciences. I do a lot of uh, computer science as well. I, in, the, uh, in Paris 8, I teach at the School of Mathematics, Informatics, Computer Science. So, um, but I do that from the communication science point of view. As Massimo was saying, uh, Paris 8 is a very peculiar university because uh, it's mainly oriented towards humanities. So sometimes in computer science we say, well, we have this big project that we want to present, but it might not be accepted. We, we might not get funded because there is some other guys from philosophy working on Spinoza who will surely get the grant. So maybe not computer science, but Spinoza will get the grant. So when I came to that and I, and I said, well, so great. So this philosophy has driven this university. That's because, as maybe you know, well, maybe not, but Paris 8 was founded by uh, Hélène Sixou and Michel Foucault, and then Michel Foucault hired Gilles Deleuze, and Gilles Deleuze hired Jean-François Lyotard, and Alain Badiou, Jacques Rancière. So we have these like ghosts uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in Paris 8. So, but however, I, 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 I like to do things abroad. So I work with some colleagues from the United States, from mainly the Cultural Analytics Lab. And uh, I am mainly involved with the um, uh, association, the International Association for Digital Semiotics. And uh, once more, I will be here for uh, this month. So what I want to share with you, and please don't hesitate to interrupt, to raise a hand, wave, and uh, ask if, if you want to, 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 to want me to stop and to go deeper into some things that, that I will show. I will show a lot of images as well. And uh, the first part is going to be like a little bit technical, but uh, also a little bit like perhaps my own view on semiotics because semiotics uh, is well, it's, uh, gladly a, a, a big field. We have different traditions, so I will have to share my own uh, tradition that I have created for, for my own. And then uh, this background will uh, take us to some practices and strategies for a lot hiding and uncovering uh, identity or data, how do we track uh, traces, digital traces, in, in now that we have the web for some 20 years now. And uh, what I do uh, as well is that I, I like to do things. I like to, to practice, I like to, to, to use uh, uh, digital objects. I want to not only to analyze, but also to do things, to, to go and explore and touch and get my <coughs> hands dirty with, with data and uh, using and coding and things like that. So that's going to be the last part. I'm going to show you what I, what I do. So just don't, once more, don't uh, hesitate to interrupt and ask things. So let's first start with uh, a little uh, technical introduction to digital images, because that's mainly what we are going to, this is going to be like our uh, object of the story. I mean, it's about images, but uh, you know, uh, now we have uh, smartphones, we produce, perhaps all of you, you have Instagram accounts, you have Facebook accounts, you create, we all create images, and the amount of images that we create every day is like uh, exploding and, and, and getting bigger, so uh, we have a lot of issues about well, how can we analyze that kind of images, uh, but mainly what is a digital image, right? So that's going to be uh, the first thing to, to, to know because it's not a poster anymore, it's not a painting, which a painting would be like a 3D uh, object. Digital image is like a representation, you know? It's like uh, a mathematical, it's, a, uh, it's, it's all numbers that we will see, that we see uh, uh, in fresh represented on the screen, and uh, which is very fun to, to realize that sometimes uh, we say that uh, digital images are like, mm, you can copy and we have different copies of the same image, but uh, the, the technicality and the, and the many levels of intricacies of the technical objects 
make that sometimes a digital image is like an original image every time. Because the image that I produce is maybe not going to be the same image that you will render in your screen. We will, we will see. But this is going to be like a technical definition. Just don't, don't pay a, a lot of attention to this definition. It only says that a digital image is only that. It's a, it's a discrete, that means that's a limit, a definite, a, 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 a limited amount of values. These values are, uh, have colors. And these colors, these values, are like stored, arranged, in a particular order. So we have like, it's very linear. So, okay. So, uh, and what about that? So, um, uh, it's, um, it's fun to say that uh, also digital images and digital uh, procedures, digital techniques are now uh, an, an ecosystem, a, a, a huge environment we live in to, maybe this is gonna be like my, posture against these digital objects. We live like in, in, a, in, a, in a bubble, in a, in a, in a, in a bubble where uh, all our images, all the, the, the photos that we take, we are like mm, not limited, but we are like into, not, not trapped as well, but we are into this world. I mean, uh, every photo that we take is gonna be like the, 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 the lenses it's going to capture the reality and it's going to store it in the, in the same order. Why? Because the screen is going to need the same uh, order to restore the values. So uh, when you go to, to, to make a photocopy or to scan an image, it, it, it also it's, it's created for um, efficiency methods. We, we use, for instance, JPG images, PNG images. That um, And why do we use JPG? PNG because it's more efficient, because it's very cheap to transfer them, it's very uh, easy and faster to, to transfer those images over the internet. So we don't even question sometimes what's inside a JPG image, what's an JPG image. So uh, this is not new, of course, it was because uh, the, the, when, when the first uh, screens arrived around the 60s, for instance, when informatics uh, arrived, we uh, Explore what we were what we were doing before. I mean that this this is this is from 1850 when uh, photography used halftone. So it, as you can see, that they have the same order, linear order for for representing uh, differences in values in tones, and then to of course uh, replicate what our human vision will 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 see. Some years later, the television is the same. You know, the television is the same, uses the same, the same uh, range of values and orders. And today we have this, we have pixels. We, we sometimes call them pixels, but indeed they are not really pixels. I mean, there they are different kinds of pixels. We have screen pixels, pixels on the screen, but inside the, but it, 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 screens, they are very different. They, they have different sizes of screens. And the image that you took, you have seen perhaps this one, the image that you took like, Ten years ago, or five years ago, which was like very small, when you open that image now, and you see, oh yes, when I used to have this smartphone, it was very small image. Now it's, I, I, I have to go again to this city because this image was like very small. I, I can't use this image anymore. So we would go back to, to take the same photograph with a, with a image from, with a, with a phone or a camera from today. But it's going to be the same within some some times later. So, what's indeed a pixel? This is not really a pixel. You know, a pixel as we were saying is like a, a values. Every image it's a it's a real uh, it's a real combination of different values. So, the fact that we think about pixels in, in, in terms of squares is because all all of our screens are squares, are rectangles. Okay, in different uh, fields scientific fields, some scientists use uh, round screens, or some of them use like uh, triangle screens, or they use different uh, shapes. But the main public, it's very efficient, very, it's faster, it's easier, it's cheaper to deliver images and to make devices based on the rectangular screen. So if you take these values, you can arrange those values, and 
then you you will create like uh, shapes. But it could be it could be anything else. Okay. So um, this is just to say that um, uh, we have a different level. We have the image, and then you have what is represented on the screen. So we have different levels. How do we analyze different levels? How do we um, what are the components? Where, where, do, where do we start to start then analyzing this kind of, uh, of, of new data or images that we have, or that, that is digital image? So, uh, of course, we have today different kinds of problems about uh, how do we describe images, because when you take a photo, you have technical metadata, you have visual metadata, and we have cultural metadata. When you take a photo, you, maybe you know that uh, every camera will like store automatically the uh, the model of the of the of the camera, the lenses, even the I know you have all the things all the things in here, the aperture, the shutter speed, the color tone, the format, the size, the date, uh, all all all, the, all those things. So this is going to be technical metadata. We will learn how to exploit this. Metadata. You have, of course, visual metadata. You have uh, colors, you have saturation, you have brightness. Any image is a combination of these three factors colors, uh, uh, saturation, hue, saturation, brightness. And then, of course, colors are determined by three colors. We only, all our devices use three colors red, green, and blue. Um, and, of course, those combinations we will. Uh, we will see then surfaces, and then we can detect shapes. We can detect uh, if the shape is round, or, or instead of round, it's uh, rectangular. We can, we can uh, for instance, analyze images and determine how many particles are in this image, how many, for instance, clouds, how many uh, faces, how many eyes we have in this image. But in the end, it's all a combination of these small uh, basic units uh, of visual metadata. And of course, there will be a higher level, which is going to be the cultural metadata. What do you think about that image? What is your reaction to that image? What do you see in that image? What uh, inspired you about taking this photo? Well, how do you relate this image? So as you can see now, uh, an, an, an image, you, you have this image, you can describe, you can you imagine like a, an Excel grid. You have one image, how do you like categorize this image? You categorize by colors, by maybe what you see inside, maybe what the kind of music that you were listening when you took the photo, what were you, I mean, what what was the place where you were uh, visiting when taking the photo. So this all we have, we have all the databases now that deal with digital images are like very big because we, we can have in the same place all those kinds of metadata. So we have we think about now a wide, uh, wide data, not only big data. So uh, well, just to move a little bit faster. Uh, anyhow, we have like different uh, representations of the image. We have, uh, of course, digital representation. In, 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 in this example, all three in the in, in the in the lower part of the screen are the same. I mean, it's only. It's the same uh, representation, it's only described differently. You have values, pixel values, you have what you will see, you have like the squares, white or black, or you have the programming language that was created to do this grid of images. So it's all, it's all like the same, you know, when, when, when some people will, you, if you have seen the, the picture, the matrix, for instance, the, 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 the film, sometimes, we, 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 we see that they, they see the reality in, in form of codes, and they say, well, it's easier to see that in code because it goes that it goes so many it goes very very fast that it takes a lot of time to 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 render the code into an image, so it's easier to see the code, but it's all the same. You are we are seeing the same the same thing. So so this is important because uh, this is what. Uh, it's a quote from a professor at MIT, very uh, interesting in cognitive and psychology and uh, perception. See, he said that, well, this is important because how information is represented can greatly affect how easy it is to 
do different things with it. So that takes us to um, really think about the kind of software that we use. Why do you use, how, how, how come did you pick uh, Word, for instance, to do your text? And why not OpenOffice? And why not Google Docs? Why do you choose, for instance, Photoshop instead of GIMP? Why do you use this kind of software and not another one? It's, the, it's a culture, I think, as well, doing software. Software is like a reflection, a projection of our own mm, motivations, objectives, our uh, vision of the world. That's, that's a, a, a software as well. Uh, so, <coughs> if you have used, uh, for instance, Photoshop, uh, this was from the very early version of Photoshop, but uh, some of these uh, icons have been like reused and we have, we, we see them like uh, in, in any other uh, software, not only Photoshop, but what I, what I only want to say is that this is, if, if, if you see this arrangement of features, of uh, possibilities, of properties, of uh, actions, how, how, how can we act with uh, digital images? So if you double click this icon, for instance, you will uh, pop up this window and you have different other values and you are delimited by uh, the parameters that the software developer allowed us to, 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 to manipulate. For instance, let's, let's imagine that you want to, for instance, change the repeat rate instead of 10, you want to test like 50. You can do 50, but you cannot do 200, you cannot do 100. Or, you, you, for instance, if you have seen the red, green, and, uh, and blue, uh, red, green, and blue values. You have maybe seen that you can go, you can choose anything from zero to 225, and you cannot choose 226, 300. We are delimited to this this kind of uh, choices. It's a technical choice, but of course you have also what um, is given to you to manipulate those technical parameters. So uh, we will come back maybe to this one. This is another software which I like very much, Context Free, which is created for uh, designers. As you can see now, we, do, we don't have that much buttons, we don't have that much interface, uh, graphical user interface. You only have to write uh, some uh, specific mathematical rules, some variation. You have only one button and, and different variations. You create this kind of image. Or if you like music, for instance, maybe you have used pure data, which uh, you create images by, by connecting boxes and then uh, manipulating data and uh, digital <coughs> values in the form of, uh, of graphical, di diagrammatical representation of that uh, properties. So three different examples that we can, that we can do. So my own, um, what I want to say now, well, my, my own discourse is that, well, we are consumers, of course, of images, of digital images. We are consumers, we, every day we see images, we like images in the internet, we uh, share images, we, uh, we use images. But on the other side, if we, if we go to the other side of the mirror, as we would say, why don't we create our own software why don't we create our own tools? Why don't we create our own vision of the world to manipulate, to deal with those kind of uh, images as well? Why not? So let's, let's do that. So um, that was the, the introduction. So the, the, my, my, a little bit of semiotics, of course, because it, this is a course. Well, um, you know, in Paris, we have, uh, of course, uh, the, the semiotic the Parisian school of semiotics, which, which was very influenced by a guy called uh, Algirdas Greimas, who uh, was the doctoral, the advisor of many big names today in the world of French semiotics. I'm thinking about Jacques Fontaine, I'm thinking about Denis Bertrand, I'm thinking about uh, and some other who has passed away, Jean Marie Cloche. And, but, uh, Reimas was like, influenced by the, this linguistic tradition of semiotics that started with uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, and then we have uh, Gensler, and then uh, 
there, this is why we can see this distinction between the content, which would be the interpretation, and we have the expression plane, which would be that what we can see, what we can, what, what we, what is perceptible, the material part. But let's let's uh, unfold this model. Um, let's unfold this model because we said, okay, you have these planes, expression and, 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 and content, but in, in inside of those planes, we have two, two more uh, sub-levels that exist for both planes, form and substance. Form, which is going to be kind of the same, form is uh, what would be the, uh, the meaning of what we are uh, seeing, of the substance that we are seeing or manipulating, and um, it's the same in the content. Okay, so let's Let's try to apply this to our digital images. So um, this is a, a simple model that I, that I uh, took from uh, Jack Fontani, which is, a, um, as I was saying, a French scientist. He proposed some years ago what he calls the, the generative expression, um, how, how do you say, generative uh, trajectory of expression. So he said that, okay, mm, Instead of focusing on the content, on interpretations, we can see what, uh, we can focus on what, on, on, on the material part of those um, occurrences, of those instances. So that it all starts with signs, texts, objects, practices, and strategies, and life forms, which will be that, like shared imaginations and, uh, and uh, visions. If we want to, uh, <coughs> Mm, apply that to uh, our um, digital images, maybe we can think about this kind of model. Any image or any mm, digital representation would have to start, of course, with the binary code, okay? We cannot, we cannot go over that because it's all the, the, the circuits, the, the, the processors, everything is done on the binary code. In the end, Computer, it's like manipulating, storing, it's, it's, it's storing uh, values. Storing values and in, a, in an efficient way so that the computer will analyze, will count those values. But those binary codes, we can, we can of course never use binary code. That's the machine, what the machine does. So what we use is like, we use data types, which is more appealing to a programmer, maybe not for us right now, but for programmers, they will know exactly what is an array, what is a, a graph, what is a tree, what is uh, all those kind of structures. And they will create algorithms on top of those, those data structures. They will create an algorithm that will, for instance, count the amount of uh, values in, in an image. Or there's another algorithm that will say, okay, let's get all those values and then we'll try a, a filter. So we'll apply a filter that will, I don't know, distort the image. Or then we create an al another algorithm that will change the color, only the red color. Or let's create algorithms that we have plenty, plenty of algorithms. And algorithms, how, how do we use algorithms? We use programming languages. It depends on you, on which kind of programming languages you want to use, but maybe you, maybe you have heard about Java, or JavaScript, or C++, or Python, or uh, Ruby, or HTML, things like that. So if you choose any programming language, this programming language will allow you to do some things, and some other uh, programming language will allow you to do other things. In the end, a software or an environment is a combination of different programming languages, and of course, a lot of algorithms that call another algorithm, it's, it's very complicated. And, of course, sometimes we don't use programming languages, we use graphical user interfaces. We use buttons, we use sliders, we use text fields, and uh, to, to see what is on, on, on the screen. But in the end, of, of course, the screen is it's, it's always the screen, the rectangular screen. What we see is always going to be in this rectangular screen. And uh, you have different display technologies, but all are the same based on that. So what this uh, trajectory means is that if we want, for it, if we if we accept or we, if we accept the challenge of not only consuming images but also 
trying to create our own tools, we have to like uh, go further into, into, into the deep components and then manipulate those components and then to come back again to the surface and create our own interpretations of, uh, of software. So this is the same, the same model, just in a different fashion, you know, like to see those kind of uh, examples, those visual examples. But it's more, it's, it's the same as I was, as I was saying, only examples. Uh, um, so strategies, um, strategies and practices. When we use software, of course, we, we use it for, because we have to do something, because we need, we have a need, we, we, we have to do something. We, we use text processors, we use Word because we have to render our final essay, our exam, or we have to use, I know, uh, a, 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 any kind of software. So um, what, what, what I mean is that it, that, that's our own um, like freedom. How do we use these kind of objects? We can be like the ideal reader, like the ideal user that will use the software as it was um, given to him. The software developer thought about the, the, what, we can, what we would do with Word. So the developer, Microsoft, said, OK, so you are like the average user, you will use Word in this, like this. So this is the user manual. And I say, well, why? There are some digital artists that will say, no, no, I am a digital artist. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with Microsoft. I will take a Word file, a doc file, and I will just translate the data and then make music with a, with a doc file, for instance. Or there are some other artists that would, that would use, for instance, Excel not only for doing uh, financial um, things, but maybe they will create like, they, will, they, they create images using this, the cells, and they create images, pixel images using Excel. And uh, so these are like our own strategies using software. So for instance, if you have, if you, if you have ever wondered if, you, if Word can, uh, Microsoft Word can order, to, it's very difficult to use Word because you cannot, for instance, order alphabetically a list, for instance. Uh, or you cannot produce uh, combinatorial poet, po poetry using Word, for instance, I know. But well, so this is very, very, very funny because, uh, not funny, but maybe, maybe, I'm not gonna be, I, I don't wanna be like fatalist, but uh, um, <laughs> the software that we use is like, uh, uh, it's, it's an industry, you know, it's, it's all based in this capitalist model, it's an industry. You can think about like this big life form of capitalism where uh, all software is created by dividing labor, dividing the, the labor dividing. So uh, that's why we use those kind of programming languages based on what we call object-oriented languages. And uh, that because it makes it easier to develop and to uh, deploy and to debug and to use and to sell software and to and then you can think about this obsolescence program obsolescence that will say okay this this piece of software you can only use this for two years and then you have to buy another license so well this is this is like we can discuss more about this okay so let's let's see some 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 examples. Uh, I think that today we, when we use software, when we use, when we see this kind of digital strategies, now we are in the level of strategies. You know? Hiding and uncovering would be like a kind of a strategy. How do we use this kind of software? Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, this uh, desire, this um, interest on black boxing software. Developers don't want to know, for instance, Facebook wouldn't like you to know how uh, they do to match, for instance, who would be like uh, willing to contact you. Or for instance, YouTube wouldn't be likely to give you the algorithm to know how they, for instance, do, I don't know, uh, predictions on what will you will see later. Or uh, Google, which started with PageRank, now it's like, it's a very different algorithm and it changes almost every day, just as Facebook. 
So it's black boxing. What is black boxing? We'll see in a, in a, in a, in a while. And there is also on the opposite, like uh, at the same time, they are like, they want to black box. They don't want to see what's inside, but uh, they want also to, to, to put like traces, like to see how do you use, how do we use this kind of software. So black box, it's, um, I don't know if you have seen this kind of diagram, but it's what we call in semiotics a, 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 a um, carré semiotique, it's like a square, semiotic square, that's in English. You have like the ideal, the white, the white box, that would be like the ideal oh. software, to me it would be like a free software, like a free and open software, when you can access the code, you can see how it's, how it's done, you can see what's the algorithm that was used. But in the opposite, you will have like the, the, the black box that you don't see anything what's inside. You can only use, click on a button and that's it. You don't see what's that. That was Norbert, Norbert uh, Wiener who, who started with these definitions of white box and black box. But right with that, what about a red box? Red box would be like when we use, when we create our own tools, and we create that for artistic things, for experimental things, or even pedagogical matters. That would be like using, playing with this kind of software for our own uh, intentions. Or would we have also the gray box, which would be like kind of in the middle, like an ideolo ideological software, when you can see a little bit inside, and you can, of course, uh, personalize a little bit of this software. This is, perhaps you have seen this, this image. This is a, a diagram of a shared lab about the ecosystem of uh, Facebook. This is how Facebook traces you. This is every time that you create an account, this value will communicate with this other value, which will communicate with this other value, and this, this is how this big uh, network of relationships is handled by Facebook. Of course, this was not given by Facebook. The artists or the researchers had to use a lot of different software and services to try to imagine what's inside Facebook. So just, if you want to, then you can, you can go afterwards, you can zoom to the specific parts. Uh, today we, 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 we talk a lot about machine learning, deep learning, and they say that it's very difficult to visualize what's inside a neural network, because we will say that, for instance, a neural network will be like, you, you give an image, and the software will try to imagine what's inside the image. If there's a face, who's that face? Is that Obama? Is that uh, Emmanuel Macron? I don't know. And uh, what happens between the input and the output is like this all kind of hidden layers. In this example, there's only six layers, but in the real world, we have like 60 or more different layers that will uh, analyze images. So that's also a kind of example of black boxing because we do, you, sometimes with machine learning, we don't know what's happening. An example of that is, uh, maybe you have seen this video when uh, a group of researchers uh, created a, a, a version of Barack Obama saying things that he wouldn't say because he was using like machine learning, like replacing the face and uh, manipulating the, the, what other guy was saying instead of Obama. This was done using fake app. Fake app, if you can download if you want to, if you have the enough computing resources to load this program, because it takes a lot of time, but fake app is it's still available to download and then try to start doing this kind of thing. Or maybe you have seen these images as well. Uh, this is the new, the, the next Rembrandt, which was created by a, by a couple of researchers at Microsoft and ENG. They analyzed the whole uh, history of uh, Rembrandt and they created a new Rembrandt. So it was 3D printed in detail. So they say that it takes all of the elements, all of the basic components of the style Rembrandt would use. The other one is Kandinsky. This is, these are both from 2016. And uh, my, my advisor, uh, he uses 
generative poetry. He hides himself into these per, into these characters, into this persona. He would he has his own software. He creates digital poetry. He generates poems, and then he pastes. He he would copy and paste those poems into this Facebook account. <coughs> he has today like. 11 Facebook accounts, fake Facebook accounts, all, all, all are like poets, digital poets. And he has like, I don't know, 50 blogs where he used these kind of things. And he put Paul Mephisto to dialogue with uh, Rachel and they, they, they talk and people think that they are really real. So, well, uh, that's what he's doing. And tracing digital what about tracing digital, tracking digital traces? If you have used Live Beam, this is a Facebook, a Facebook, a Firefox extension that will allow you to see what other uh, websites share the information. When, when you go to a, a, a website, the website would like uh, know when did you connect, where did you connect, at what time, how much time did you spend, where did you click. And some of those websites will communicate this data to other, to, other, to other services or to other software. That will be the small triangles. So this is only yesterday. I was like visiting 43 sites, and I created this, this little network of things. And you can see that, for instance, academia sent a lot of information, all music, and uh, well, Netflix, things like that. Maybe I should move faster, no. Are we okay? Does it? Yeah. So, um, another thing, for instance, when, when, when I was talking about JPG images, when you take photos, images, uh, in the end, it's like, uh, it's, it, a JPG image is like, as you see in the, in the left, it's all a sequence of uh, codes, of, of values, as we, as we were saying, and, uh, at some point, it makes sense if you if you if you if we would like to read what's happening inside this JPG image. We don't see the visual part; we only see the code, of course. But inside this code, we can hide information. We can not hide, but store information uh, regarding the, the the what what's inside the picture. For instance, you can have this 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 kind of metadata. This kind of metadata, as you can see, it's between the, uh, it's in the second lane, when you will see the code FFEO. Between that code and FFEF, that's where you store EXIF metadata. And EXIF metadata, what's that? It's, it's, it's a standard, it's a model. It's shared by Apple, Facebook, Google, and uh, all, 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 all companies that create uh, devices. So this is how we store things inside the, 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 the image itself. And uh, if you use, for instance, this application Photo Meta, it's also possible to see, for instance, when you took the image, not only where were you taking the image, not only at what time, but were you pointing at what direction of the, of the, of the, of the phone. That would be, that would be like fun to see, I mean, I don't know, to create like something weird or an experimental visualization of like taking these photographs and seeing what, how the, the picture was pointed to, oriented to. And that's it's in the same, in this part, it's a, these are like watching Stonehenge, like, like that, something to that. So you can, you can have that information. So to start, like, uh, conclude, concluding this, this presentation, let me show you some, some things that I do. So uh, I chose my own things because I know how I made those things, so you can ask me some kind of question of why did you do that, how come, and things like that. So I take full responsibility. Mm, uh, and these all are in the end, like in, I'm trying to work on this concept of deep visualization. What I would like to do now is like to move from creating my own tools into creating my own transparent tools. Tools that, for instance, you would have 
like a representation, you click on something and you would see like maybe next to what you click, what's happening inside the algorithm, what hap what's, what all the, the kind of processes that are going on behind the scenes. So this is a, a, a conceptual thing that we are working now with a, with a colleague and we will see what happens. But first, this is what, what I kind of do. I, I, I like images, of course. I, I visualize, I try to visualize image. And I have been working with uh, Lev Manovich and his team um, on, on that since 2009 now. And uh, this is kind of the projects that I do. For, for to me, it's like very important to, to not only to, to play or to use uh, or to deconstruct software or to, or to just uh, play with software, but also to, 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 to record how, how did I create this, to create, to, to, to analyze, to document the workflow of doing. So first we have a collection of images. I have this uh, software, which is called ImageJ. Then I have a, a couple of scripts that will do something with that collection of images. And in the end, I will have like a, 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 a graph of images. So this is the, the result. So uh, I did this for uh, uh, a conference that, uh, on visual semiotics because we, we were interested in, in, in analyzing the whole uh, Paul Klee uh, production. Of course, production available in the web. And so I took all the images from WikiArt, which is an open uh, open directory where you can download images. So there are only there are only two, 203 images. So how do we analyze 203 images? As you can see now, there, there are like uh, a range by years and saturation. The lines is only me. I, it's just for decoration, it's like, like for seeing how, how they are, what's first and what's next in terms of value. But, uh, in the end, we can, of course, the same data, we can think about creating different representations. This is the same data, just mm, ordered differently. Maybe I can show you. This is the same data, just ordered differently. This, these, are, these are the same, right? So this is like a, a, a circle, bars, and this. I can, I can show you this, maybe. What I, what, I, what I like to do is like creating interactive visualization, because in the, in, in the first, in 2008, we were creating this kind of uh, visualizations, but they were like static, only, only on the posters. But I, we wanted to, to, to see like uh, something interactive. So let's get rid of this texture. Let's get this one. So this is a very famous uh, image in visual semiotics. It was analyzed by some of major semioticians, so, okay, we have some, some things in here. So this is very, very, very full, very, very easy, but uh, it was from Walter Benjamin had this, this picture. Well, so um, this, is, this is kind of what I, what I want to do. So this was, this was for Paul Klee, but I, I, I really like also not only mm, like mm, high culture images, but also, what about popular culture images? For instance, album, album, CD album covers. Well, not CD because CD doesn't exist anymore, but album covers. <coughs> so what you are seeing here is that there are 2,000 album covers that I took from all music. They are arranged into a in form of a mosaic by colors. But of course, we can arrange that in, in, like this. This is what we call a histogram of images. And uh, as you can see, a histogram, mm, it starts, mm, it goes, it's, mm, it's arranged by hue. A hue is like, if you have seen the, the chromatic circle, it starts with zero degrees on top, and you go like mm, 120, which would be green, 240, which would be blue, and then 360, which would be reddish. So. If you unfold the circle, not like this, but if you unfold like this, it will be like starting from zero to, to 360. 
So that's why we see a lot of uh, red, things, not that much of green, for instance, uh, album covers. I don't know why. But you have a lot of uh, blue and uh, mainly yellow and, uh, and red. The same things in using a different algorithm, very, very experimental visualization, because the question was that if you have these images, if you have, that, you have these values, we can, do, we can do whatever we want to. This is 3D uh, visualization. You can do, of course, it was like flattened into a 2D view, but it's a 3D in, in, in deep. Following this kind of experimental mathematical equations that you can just apply to any data. Uh, so, for instance. Nonetheless, they are the same 2,000 images. This other one is it's a, it was done also for another um, conference on visual semiotics. I took uh, Mark Rothko, so it was 220, 201 images available once more in WikiArt. So what I did is like uh, I arranged them by, by date, and this is like uh, what would be like colored, colored rings. And uh, what you would see is like from the inside, that is the, 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 the early work by Rothko. And going to the outside is going to be like the, the, the more recent or the latest part period of Rothko. And you would see that, for instance, it's very easy in, Warco, in, in Rothko because we can see that he had this progression in style where he was, he was like very mm, concrete in the end. But the same thing we can apply to any other kind of, uh, kind of uh, source, any kind of image. This is, for instance, if you have heard about the, the grunge uh, group band Nirvana, these are the, the whole videos by Nirvana. So these are like color rings, I don't know how do you want to call them. So we need semiotics because sometimes we are into this um, experimental and uh, unstable part that we would like to try to assign an interpretation or even a, a, a name. How do, you feel, how do you call this kind of experiment? It happens that some, some, sometimes they want, it, it raises some aesthetic provocations. So once uh, they contacted me from Winchester in the UK to create, like, uh, 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 to use my software and then create uh, an exhibition of other kind of images. I said, yeah, sure, okay, go ahead, use the software and I can, we can do other things. And they created this exhibition and, and it was like more, as I was saying, more like ludic, artistic uh, use of this kind of mm, methods. We have, of, of course, just to finish 3D visualization. I know if you make sense of this, but of course it's like uh, what we call in semiotics uh, proto icons. Uh, you see something, but if you don't have the key, the key to, to interpret or to know what's, what we are seeing, it's gonna be very difficult. So in here what you have is like, we have around 200 mm, screenshots from the homepage of Google from the beginnings, from 1988 to 2015. So as you can see, we have mm, from the left, the early version of Google, and then to the right, like the latest Google. So this, this, there's an animation. Um, you can see a thing, but it's a, it's a, it's a 3D model. So uh, we, can, we can navigate, we can go inside. But what we can see is that, for instance, it has been used for exploring how, how Google has implemented tabs, buttons, and different things that would make easier for some users to use Google as a, re as a search engine or as the window to the web. You know, it's, Google is like, it's a verb now. Google it, I will Google it. So now in here we can see that all those kind of graphical interface elements that appear. So 
Yeah, maybe I have to increase the, the brightness of the light. So how do we do this? Well, I, I, as I was saying, I like to document uh, how, I, how I do this. This is the code for doing this. Yeah, but the code, as we were saying, is like in the level of programming language. So this is, would be the level of algorithms, which were the algorithms that were used. Let's only put attention to the, to the last one, 3D Viewer, <coughs> which uses those parameters. 3D Viewer uses more algorithms based on data structures, based on some kind of parameters as well, using specifically that kind of algorithm, marching cubes, which is from the 1986, which is like this. So this is once more my view of like, like going into these levels and then going afterwards. So this will be like the, the main algorithm. How is it implemented? This is the code and this is the result. So as you know, the result, maybe you have seen this image, which has, do you see Game of Thrones in this? Yeah. It, it, it just started, it's in episode three now. So uh, it changes, as you, can, as you know, it changes. The, the, the main introduction changes. So uh, uh, some time ago, I, I, I took this, this, this image. Uh, maybe you, you know now what this is. It's the average brightness of all the frames that compose this small video. It's a very small video, you know, 20 seconds. But in an average, it will be like this. Of course, this city does not exist. Start. Not even in this series, but uh, it has never existed. So what you are seeing in here is like the, the rendering, the virtual camera that did the render of the 3D object, and where the brightness was most of the time rendered. If you see, if you think about computer graphics, it would be like where where would be like the main um, computing um, energy spent. The image, um, and because it's an object, as I was uh, telling you with uh, with Google, as it, because it's an object, a 3D object. Right. Well, today in 2019, we can go to any 3D printer in the corner, and we can uh, have this kind of uh, objects. Of course, this is mm, I, I I I did this for for fun, but well, for for some other reason, but. It was uh, a challenge to this printer because it was there were so many vertices, there were so many polygons and geometry, and uh, I, it can be done easy, more easier today. It was like 2011, but well, my, my thing is that we can we can we can move also to the to the, to the real world. So to to conclude, because maybe we can we can have some time for discussion or. Questions. I would like only to highlight, or to raise, to, to, to devote, to come back to the importance of um, using hybrid methods. Because today we would hear that uh, machine learning and all these kind of high-level uh, computing techniques to analyze all those kind of images and things like that. Well, as we have seen. These are, of course, they are, yes, they are automatic, or they are based in a particular view of how do we handle this kind of data. So sometimes when we are in front of black boxes, we would, only, we would also need some manual uh, methods to analyze, to gather, to, to get uh, the kind of information that we want. And uh, maybe we can, we can, of course, use them in, in, in conjunction. We can, use, we can use them both, depending on what we want to do. But um, I think it's important to, 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 to try to not only consume images, but also to, uh, to try to use them, to try to manipulate them, to try to see, OK, what's, what's, what's happening in here? What's inside? It was very difficult, like, you know, when, when I was young, like when I was studying communication to use uh, to have a computer to have like, like to have the software so today we have like a lot of um, open source and free software we can we can install things we can some of these software that I, I, I just um, 
show to you is mainly used by, by scientists, for astronomers, for medicine, but they all use images. So why don't we use other tools that are not mainly for uh, culture or for our communication purposes, but we can just move from other fields, get tools, and then try to use them and then try to, to, to analyze them. It's going to be very fun. It's, it's, it is very, very interesting to see how, how uh, other software, for instance, scientific software, talks to the, to the, to the user because uh, the terms, the verbs, the, the objects that they, they, they present are very different. Uh, so I think, I think it's, very, it's very important to, 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 to use, to touch, to, to manipulate those kind of things if you are talking about digital media. And uh, I think, of course, that uh, maybe, maybe mm, just to conclude, maybe mm, mm, in an implicit manner, we are developing this kind of digital culture that we, we know this is like the, the, the controversy between uh, what we call the, the, the new users, the millennials, that they, uh, they were born using uh, smartphones and Facebook and things like that, they have this kind of developed digital culture. But I think it's like, uh, it depends on what kind of, on, on what, how you are using, what's the strategy of using this kind of tools, this kind of software. We can, we can be like very skillful to um, post, to use Twitter and to say uh, violent things and things like that. But there is another different aspect of using this kind of tools in more like a communication or semiotic uh, standpoint, like uh, seeing what's the, the, the graphical configuration, what is the diagrammatical relationship between why the menu is here, why this color is here, how come I have only these options available and not more, what would I have to do if I, if I want more options? So, uh, of course, it's, it's very, you have, we, you, we have, or you have, or we have a, a big responsibility using when we prototype this kind of thing because with the web, as you know, you can you you, you just you, you don't only create a website and don't and just share with your own peers, but it's online. It's it's for the world. So uh, that is very that's amazing because you can test, you can deploy that, and uh, but of course it's a responsibility because you are like creating a, a space, you know? So, uh, and technical skills, we have to, I, I, that's my point of view, I would have to, 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 to complete this, this digital culture, we have to maybe develop some, a little bit of this kind of technical skills, mainly in communication, because if it's not in communication and semiotics, uh, which we are the, the um, experts in, Humanities, it's not going to be uh, anybody else, maybe. So I think that was the, what, we, what I wanted to share, and I hope this phrase is well written. And, uh,